is crowned with glory now. The Savior now to wash our feet. Now at His feet we bow. The one who wore our sin and shame now robed in
to be the resurrected King. He's resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrected. Welcome to Wednesday Night Nuggets. I'm Pastor Colin Ford at Alam Rock Christian Church in San Jose, California. And we just like to take a few minutes out in the middle of the week to get a little bit of refreshment through God's Word and see what God has to say for us today. This evening we are going to be looking at the topic of sorting out sin. And if you would like to turn in your Bibles with me to Romans 3, chapter 3, 9 through 26, I think you'll get a lot more out if you follow through as we read through the scripture. I'm using a King James version. Um, if you have an NIV, ESV, or other version, the words may be slightly different, but the meaning, I'm sure, will be the same. So we're starting at Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 26. <clears throat> what then? Are we better than they... No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is open is an open sepulcher with their tongues they have used deceit. Their poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things Soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. May God add the blessing of the reading and hearing of his word this evening. So our question becomes this evening, what is sin? Some people think sin is doing things that are bad. And they're right. Some people think sin is specific to breaking of the Ten Commandments. Some people think sin is archaic and an out-of-date concept. So this evening, 
Let's take a few minutes and take a look at what the Bible really defines as sin. No one can read the Bible very much without realizing that there is a great deal of attention given to the subject of sin, its cause and cure. We often think of sin in connection with murder and other heinous crimes, but sin in the Bible is defined as anything that falls short of God's perfection. In Romans 3.23, we read, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The key here is the glory of God. This includes the thought of absolute perfection. We are to be righteous, just like God. God has set a mark for how we are to relate to Him, and anything short of that mark is sin, just like an arrow missing the bullseye of a target. All men everywhere are guilty of falling short of God's expectation for us. Sin is further de defined in the Bible. First in Romans chapter 5, verse 13, as breaking the law of God. Second, it's defined as rebellion against God or lawlessness as outlined in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Sin is a transgression of the law. This word transgression means an intentional disobedience, misbehavior, or indiscretion. Third, sin is moral impurity. David talks about this in Psalm 32, 5. And fourth, in Matthew 5, 28, Matthew explains that not only are the evil deeds sinful, but even the thoughts we have can be sinful. So, where did sin start? The first recorded of sin actually took place in heaven. No, no, you may say, wait, what about Adam and Eve? Hold your horses, wait for the bus, I'll get there in just a minute. The first instance of sin was in heaven, when the angel Lucifer became ambitious to be equal with God, as described in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. This describes the first transgression against God, and the first transgression for Lucifer's sin was pride. Lucifer wanted to be the same as God, so he was cast out of heaven and became the one for whom the Bible elsewhere describes as the devil or Satan. Now, the first, of instance, the first instance of sin on earth is described in the third chapter of Genesis. It took place, as you probably well know, in the Garden of Eden. God forbade Adam and Eve to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Satan, who had already fallen for, from heaven and continues to disobey God to this very day, tricks Adam and Eve. They disobey God and ate the forbidden fruit. They too instantly became sinners, missing the mark that God had set for them. Unfortunately, sin has consequences real consequences. As soon as the parents of the human race sinned, they instantly became aware of the fact that they were naked and tried to hide themselves from God, as described in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10. The consequences of death, excuse me, the consequences of sin is death, spiritual death. Adam became spiritually dead the moment he sinned. By this, we mean that he became separated from God and banished from God's intimate presence. He also became subject to physical death. Although he did not die immediately, his body was now doomed to die. Adam's sinful nature was passed along to the human race. Every child born of sinful parents is a sinner by birth. Now, you may hear many psychologists out there in the world claim that children are born good. That's a load of fooey. Ask them who teaches the child to bite or hit or become selfish. No one teaches the toddler to be the proverbial terrible two-year-old. Adam's eldest son Cain became a murderer. Because all men are born sinners, they are dead spiritually and are doomed to die physically one day also. Check it out in Romans 5. Verses 12 through 18. Man's sin 
brought a curse upon all creation. Thorns and thistles in our fields and gardens are evidence of this. Other examples are to be found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. We need no proof of sin as long as we have prisons, hospitals, and funeral parlors. Tears, sickness, sorrow, pain, and death are some of the results of sin. Romans 6 and 23 tells us the wages of sin is death. God has already pronounced the penalty for sin as being death. We have already seen that this indicates or includes, excuse me, both physical and spiritual death. The penalty must be paid. God must punish sin. As long as men and women live in their sins, they are spiritually death and also face physical death. If he or she physically dies and are still living in their sin, they are subject to spiritual death forever. This means that they will live forever banished from the presence of God and will suffer for their sins in the lake of fire. We call that hell. This is described in Revelation 20, chapter 14. Well, it sounds kind of pretty discouraging, doesn't it? But there is good news. The good news is that God provided a remedy so that all men and all women do not need to suffer everlasting punishment for their sins. In Romans 5, verses 8 and 9, gives us the good news. It says, For God loved us so much that he showed that love for us, that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Being justified is amazing. Being justified by God, being put right by God, is just like it never happened at all. God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into the world to provide men and women an escape from hell. Our Lord Jesus was born of a virgin Mary so that he did not inherit Adam's sinful nature. Jesus is the only sinless person who has ever or will ever live. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus was willing to die and suffer the penalty of our sin and satisfied God's holy demand for punishment for sin. Since this demand for the payment of sin has been met, then God can give eternal life to every sinner who confesses the fact that he or she is a sinner and receives the Lord Jesus Christ as his or her Savior and Lord. When a person trusts in Christ, he or she is saved from the penalty and the power of sin. This does, does not mean that they no longer commit any sins. This also does not allow us to live a sinful lifestyle just because we are forgiven of our sins. Many people who think they are saved mistakenly think that they can live an ungodly lifestyle because they will be forgiven. Not true, but it does mean for the believer that all past, present, and future sins are forgiven, that they will never be judged for those incidental non-habitual sins, and that they have the power to live for God instead of living for the pleasure of sin. In our Christian walk, we must strive to meet that mark that God has set for us. This is the process that we call sanctification. That is our lives being set aside for the glory of God as we sort out our sin and live a Christ-like life that will please God, in whom we love and trust. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for your word tonight. Father, we thank you for this clarification of what sin is, Father, and what the, the consequences of sin 
are. Father, we pray that you will keep us from all temptation of sin, Father, that when we are tempted to stray away from the way you would have us go, Father, that you would gently nudge us back, and as we keep our eyes focused on you, our lives would be free from sin, and we would live a life that is pleasing to you, live a life that brings honor and glory to you. Father, we thank you for your word. Help us to understand it and strengthen our walk with you. These things we pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we hope that uh, you got a deeper understanding of this little piece of scripture and that you uh, will strengthen your walk with the Lord this week. If you have any questions that you would like us to tackle on these Wednesday night nuggets, uh, please let us know. Uh, go on to our website at alamrock.cc. There you will find a phone number, you'll find an email and a street address. So you have no excuse. You can send us an email, you can give us a phone call, or you can send us snail mail. And we'd love to respond and try and answer your questions. Thank you again for joining us and I hope you will uh, meet again with us next Wednesday as we continue our Wednesday Night Nugget series. Good night.